So it's my pleasure now to introduce Rick for tonight's program on butterflies. Rick is an active field naturalist and author and photographer. He's an affiliate creator at Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History and Entomology and past president of the Linnaean Society in New York. Among other publications, he's the author and photographer of Butterflies of the East Coast, an observer guide, uh, that's a Princeton book. He's taught butterfly ID and nature photography at the New York Botanical Garden and uh, of course given programs for many different organizations. Uh, and co-authored the National Audubon Society Regional Guide to Florida and also has introductory chapters in the Sibley Guide to Bird Life and Behavior. So his photography has been published many places, and we get to enjoy it here tonight, which I'm very excited about. And his photographs have been even included in the American Museum of Natural History in the Bronx Zoo. And he also leads various nature trips. We're really glad to have you here with us, Rick. Thank you so much if you want to start your share. Let me just give a just a quick couple remarks going into this. Um, I am, um, as everyone says, I've been involved with butterflies for a very long time. And I know that many of you are interested. What I find is that when people go out in the field, it's very hard uh, when you're beginning to kind of get the boost up that you need. There, you know, it's hard to find people who are experienced to kind of know what you're looking at. And sometimes they're small and they're fluttering around. What I'm gonna try and do here is go through, particularly in the first part, some of the things you're more likely to see, you know, some of the commoner stuff. Um, when we get to the end, I'm going to do some of the, um, you know, some of the little bit harder stuff. Um, and but it's really not that hard once you get used to it. Um, but if I see people fleeing in panic, I'll, I'll understand. You know, you're every, every, everyone's got their, uh, you know, got the right to, um, you know, uh, limit their level of involvement with it. I, there is a screen chat available. I'm going to keep going through it. But if you have questions or if something I've said isn't clear, please put a chat in. And I think Suzanne will pass them on to me and, and, I'll, and I'll be able to react to them. So if there's no other questions now, let's get started. Here we have June butterflies around New York City. And this is actually June and early July butterflies. Now, interestingly, these three butterflies that I've shown here have one thing in common, which is I'm not gonna talk about any of them tonight. Um, essentially, if, if these butterflies are all very easy to identify, I'm only going to talk with ones where you might get confused because this is trying to help you, you know, sort out some of the close cases. So early June to mid-July, focus on problem cases with all these wonderful groups. And after we get done with the regular butterflies, we will do the dreaded skippers, um, which shouldn't be that dreaded, but people do dread them. And I, I understand that. Okay. Much of this is built around a book that I, a little booklet that I wrote back in 1993, which was a checklist of butterflies around the New York City area, um, uh, which includes most of Putnam. Actually, it includes all of Putnam, actually, but <laughs> uh, I just, the, the circle didn't go there. Um, and one of the things I'll be pointing out as we go is that even in the years since 1993, we've had a big change in the butterflies here. We've lost a lot. We've gained a lot of new ones. And so... It, it's a it's a group that un, as much as birds even more than birds has been very fluctuating and so um, yeah, it's it's hard to it, it's hard to say you know everything from the beginning um, you need to you need to kind of get experience and see what's around in your area so we're going to start with what I the New York City area dark swallowtails <clears throat> there's a number of them I'm going to mainly focus on two that you see very commonly which is the black and spice bush swallowtails. Um, I'm also going to look at the pipe vine, which you can see in your area. I'm going to ignore the eastern tiger swallowtail because if you don't know what that is, well, there's books. Also going to cover the giant swallowtail, which is interesting because when I did the checklist, there were not giant swallowtails in our area. Um, there used to be in the 1890s, um, and they have actually come back now <clears throat> uh, via the Great Lakes. And so that's been sort of an interesting development. Our period is June to July. Swallowtails right now towards the end of June are probably at their trough period. Um, as you get into the, Christ, into the I'll call it Christmas count because uh, that's just, you know, uh, force of habit. But, the, but for the 4th of July counts, as you get into July, you get lots of swallowtails and they're all coming out. In case you don't know, butterflies are in broods. 
a first brood comes out, they lay eggs, the adults die, get caterpillars, larvae, pupae, and then the adults come out. And when you see these kind of undulating waves, that's a series of broods that you're going to see. Okay, these are black swallowtails. The male on the left, the female on the right. I'm sure many of you have seen these. They, they, um, they, they feed on uh, Queen Anne's lace and such. This is spicebush swallowtail. This is a, this is a nice bright female, spicebush swallowtail. Okay, how do you tell these apart? They look pretty similar. Well, in the black swallowtail, if you look at the forewing from the top, you have two rows of, of, of dots and they are yellow. If you look at a spice bush from above, you have one row of dots and it's basically kind of greenish blue, all right? The other thing is, is that many times in a spice bush, you get a very, very big blue field, iridescent blue field here. Um, but that varies in size, so I'm not going to, I'm not pointing that out. The, the real, the thing you really look for is the, you know, is the number of dot rows. Everybody got that? Okay, moving along. The next thing you look at is the wrist dots. I call this the wrist because it's sort of the equivalent of a wrist. And you see, you get these yellow dots here on a black swallowtail. You don't on a, on a spice bush. That's all black in there. Underside has different field marks. First of all, you, you start with the same thing, which is the two dot rows on the forewing. However, you gotta be careful here because in the spice bush, you can also get a second dot row from below. You don't see it from above, but you can see it from below. And people constantly come and say, oh, but I saw two dot rows, it's gotta be a black. And it's not, it's just, it's a spice bush. Just, you know, kind of get used to it. When you're looking below, don't bother with this, those dot rows so much as much as look for this, the red line that goes down the middle of the wing. The black swallowtail has what I call a, a set of crooked teeth here. You see the crooked teeth. The spice bush has a missing tooth or a gap tooth. Uh, there, there's a, there's a, a gap in the formula. Just to show you that a little more clearly, here's the gap tooth in the black swallowtail. You can see it's just a very irregular pattern. You get, when you get used to it, you'll see it very quickly. The other thing about black swallowtails is if you get a male, particularly in the spring, the, the yellow in, uh, in, the, in the median line is really pronounced. It's huge and white and very big. And if you see anything like that, well, you know, uh, uh, around here, you basically have a black swallowtail. You're not, it's not gonna be anything like a spice bush. Okay, we okay so far? Now, recent years, we started to see giant swallowtails. They go to the hop ash trees and some other stuff, and also garden rue sometimes. Um, but they've started to, to be around, and they're around in your area. Now, these, um, these are large swallowtails. And unlike the others, they have a lateral line that goes clear across the wing. You know, this yellow line goes clear across the wing. And they have very big wrist, sp wrist spots, not little dots, very big wrist spots. Underneath, they're bright yellow, and also, if you happen to see it, they have like spatula-shaped uh, spatula tails with a spot in the middle. I call it a fried egg in a pan. Actually, I never called it that, but I just did. Now, in the summer, you get this, which is a female black uh, tiger swallowtail. Because the, in the female tiger swallowtail, in the, particularly in the summer, has a dark form. Which, which mimics the, you know, some of the other swallowtails. How do you tell it? Well, for one thing, it's got a single row. It's got no wrist spots. So it's starting to look a bit like a, you know, like a spice bush. Although if you look at it carefully, among the other things, if you see it from below, you can see the tiger stripes. You can see that it's actually a tiger swallowtail um, from below. And also, you know, I, I've noticed when you, when you point it out to people, they'll say, oh yeah, that's a, that's a tiger swallowtail. It's pretty easy to tell really. The last one that you might see in our area is the pipevine swallowtail. Now, this is a real dazzler. It generally comes more southerly than us, but as the climate has warmed up, we're seeing them more up in our area. And you, and you may find these from time to time. 
Um, you can tell these because they have a white uh, dot crescent. Now there's a, a, a dot row with, in a crescent shape. And below, they have orange balloons, I call them. Um, you know, because they're very, they're very large and very prominent on a very iridescent uh, blue field. They're, they're not very hard to tell, um, but if you see them in flight particularly, you have to look at them a little carefully because they're kind of hard to tell. Now, another one that people confuse is the red spotted admiral or red spotted purple phase of the red admiral. Um, this is not related to swallowtails at all, but it looks a little like them. And so you see, particularly if you're talking about a spice bush, they look pretty similar. But here, you, instead of the white crescent dots, you have a dark band going across. Um, it's also a completely different shape, I should add. And um, on below, if you don't just have, you use, you have a, um, a, a, a row of orange dots, but you also have it on the forewing. Um, and, and, and the forewing is important because that, that's, you don't get that on any of the swallowtails. Also, you get a bunch of, 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 of red dots in here. Um, you'll generally be able to tell these pretty easily. They fly differently also than swallowtails. Um, but, for the, but for the moment, just be aware that there is something that you need to check out. Uh, one of the things I've discovered is that if you tell people that there's things they need to look for, to be careful of, they will, people will work them out. But if they don't know there's something different, they'll make mistakes. That's why we're kind of doing this pro program tonight. Now, someday, we will get zebra swallowtails in our area as the climate warms up. Um, and these are lovely swallowtails. Right now they're sent, they, you know, they'll, they'll only get as far north as the central, you know, central Atlantic states. Um, but one of these days you're gonna see them around here and then um, we will all be very happy. Okay, common pyrids. Pyrids are sulfurs and whites, essentially. I'm only gonna look at two species. There's a lot of them I could talk about, but I'm only I like cabbage white. I'm not gonna talk about cabbage white. You see those all the time. I'm gonna talk about clouded and orange, which people mess up a lot. I almost said screw up, but I wouldn't say that. Um, as with the swallowtails, there's a gap period for the for these in, in right about now, um, and, and they but they will come out later. I'm also gonna look at a couple of the less common yellows just because you're liable to see them, the cloudless and the little yellow. So, Here's an underside of a, an orange sulfur. Doesn't look very orange, but you see a little dark. It's very bright and, 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 and strongly colored. Now, if you'll see these from the top, and by the way, you won't see them from the top all the time because they tend to keep their wings shut. But if you see them from the top, you say, well, how could I possibly have an ID problem with these? You know, that's pretty darned easy, isn't it? Well, that's true, but how about these? This is an orange sulfur in the spring, and in the spring, they don't have a bunch of orange. So in the spring, if you see something that looks like it might be a clouded or common sulfur, you wanna look at the top. If you see any orange at all, even right near the body, it's an orange sulfur. It's gotta be clear lemon yellow to be a clouded. If it has anything on it at all, it's this early spring confusing form of the orange sulfur. I see many, many sulfurs misreported as, as clouded in the spring. In the fall, you will find that both of these, the females, basically look pretty much identical like this. They look white. This is the alba form of the um, of, of the of the of our local sulfurs, and and they both they basically at that point have stopped putting their biological energy <clears throat> into making colors, and they're using it just to kind of keep alive. And so they just say, "Eh, white is good enough for me," and that's what they do. How do they tell each other apart? That's a good question. Now, this, I took these ultraviolet pictures a number of years ago. This is a picture of the upper surface of this, those two butterflies above, and this is an ultraviolet light. And as you can see, the male who's on the right reflects ultraviolet light. So if you were looking at him and you could see ultraviolet, by the way, butterflies can see ultraviolet light, but if you're looking at him um, and, and, and you see the reflection, you can say, oh, that's, pretty, that's quite pretty. If you're looking at a clouded sulfur, the male does not reflect ultraviolet light. The male absorbs ultraviolet light. This is how females tell one and the others apart. So you know, we wonder about how nature works. Well, this is how nature works. You know, There are things that we can't always see. 
There's a couple of butterflies that have gotten more common <clears throat> from the south. The cloudless sulfur is quite big, um, but we've been getting them. They're more in the fall. They tend to come up in the fall and emigrate northwards. Sometimes you get them in the spring. And there's a, there's a very large, very tall sort of sail-shaped forewing on these. Um, and, and you'll see them flying around, particularly along river beds and stuff like that, as because they're just kind of migrating north. The bad, the bad news for them is they go north and north and north, and then the weather turns cold and they stop going north because they die. You know, so but th that's their instinct. So who knows why they do it? You, another thing you may watch for if you're on senna plants or things of that type, you're liable to see this caterpillar, which has a nice yellow racing stripe, um, and they lay their eggs as they go. Um, and, and the later broods, you know, emerge from those. And if you see this green caterpillar with a nice yellow racing stripe, it's probably a clouded sulfur. One of the rarer um, emigrants from the south is called little yellow. It has a, a kind of a dark mark up here. This is the fall form, which is again kind of alba. This is the one we'd be likely to see. Now, I've had these on the Chris, on the butterfly count in, in July at, at Pound Ridge. I mean, so you can get strays up here. I mean, they're not they're not impossible. Haven't seen they're they're rare, but if you see a really tiny sulfur, you've either got a dwarf regular sulfur or you've got one of these, and so it's worth checking out. Okay, um, I'm only going to look at two of the blues. There's lots of blues around, but the only ones you're liable to see, and the only ones that are kind of interesting in our time period, um, are the um, are the eastern tail blue and the spring azure. Now, the azures are divided into a whole bunch of species now. And in 1993, they were all considered spring azure. Now there's a whole bunch of things that are considered species. The only one we're going to get in the summer in this brood here is what we call the summer azure, which is Celestrina neglecta. And it's fairly pale looking. Um, so if you see an azure this time of year, basically, okay, it's a summer azure, you know, by this, by this time of year. And the eastern tail blue, um, it has, has some broods, but it, it can be very, very common. It can be one of the commonest butterflies in field habitats and kind of wastelands. Okay. Here's the eastern tail blue. On top, the male is bright blue with a fringe. The female is kind of slaty gray. This is, the, um, this is an, an azure on top. Doesn't have as much of the dark banding, uh, dark edging on it. A little bit on the forewing. And it's much, you know, kind of paler, paler blue. The um, eastern tail blue has small tails. The um, azure has no tails. <clears throat> but warning, sometimes these tails break off. So if you see one without, if you see one with a tail, you know it's, a, it's an eastern tail. If you see one without a tail, you got to look for the next mark, which is does it have these eye spots? Because the eye spots are diagnostic. There's no eye spot, no orange eye spots on, a, on, a, on a, an, an azure. You only get those on the tail blue. Below, same difference. Um, you get prominent eye spots versus no eye spots um, on the on the tail blue versus the uh, azure, and below the sexes look alike on the on the tail blue. From above, you can see you can see even at a distance. I put this flight shot in. You can see you, can, you if this had up orange, you can see it even in flight at a distance. You know that's a very prominent field mark. You got to get used to looking for that. I had a question, Rick, because yes. uh, you said you wanted to hear those. Uh, uh, Victoria was asking the habitat for these blues and their relative size. Okay, they're small. The the um, spring azures in the summer tend to be more in woodland habitats or wood edges, generally wetter places. That's not true of the spring azure. They can be in a more variety of places. Um, but you can see them in a lot of different areas, but they tend to be around wood edges. The eastern tail blue is kind of a, a kind of a waste area butterfly. You, you're, you'll find them any old place, um, and you know, like poorly mown fields, stuff like that. And the other thing is the um, the eastern tail blue tends to fly very low. They stay very close to the ground. The spring azure frequently bounds up and flies much higher. You know, so if you see one flying up high. You've either got a um, uh, you've either got an eastern tail blue that's been um, um, on some bad mushrooms and is on a trip, or you've got a you know, or, or you've got a, an azure, which is much more likely, since I'm not aware of any of them with 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 bad or regular habits such as that. 
And in fact, the, the uh, Eastern Tail Blue Defamation Society will be contacting me shortly, I'm sure. Okay, now we're going to get into some of the interesting summer stuff. These are the large fritillaries, which, and this is the, this is the time of the large fritillaries. We're in it right now. And I'm going to talk about the variegated, which is basically a southern species, which comes up here as a stray. It starts now, and you'll see it again in September. And I'm also going to talk about the great spangled fritillary. A um, little bit less so about the Aphrodite, which is the Aphrodite. I, 10 years ago, I would have said, oh, yeah, Aphrodite, you got to pay some attention to it. It is basically gone for most of our area. And I'll, dis and, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. This is the variegated fritillary. It's a lovely butterfly, mostly southern, comes up, comes up the coast. And, and as you see, it differs quite a bit from the greater fritillaries, which are the great spangled and the Aphrodite, which are the two you could find in our area. How do you tell them apart? Well, the variegated fritillary has very clear boxy patterns and big black dots coming down the edge. No such big black dots, particularly on the hind wing, on the on the great spangled. This is a female who's quite dark in the in the central area. Um, the male can be much less so. <clears throat> this is a male Aphrodite, which is less which is less brown. And I uh, and I hate to, I even hate to do this to people, but this if you see this little tiny black dot here, you've got an Aphrodite. Um, there's a little tiny dot. This whole area in the Great Spangle is completely open. I don't have a good picture of this. The, many of the uh, Aphrodites have a very large mark here, and you can see it very easily. But if you see any little black mark, you know, kind of creeping in there, you've got an Aphrodite, which I hate, you know, um, it, on the other hand, as you can see, it can be pretty inconspicuous. So my apology, nature apologizes for not being more easily identified. Um, the wing shape is also important. The variegated has, you see, has a long kind of almost falcate wing shape, which is very distinctive. Um, the other two fertile, the red, greater fertile is very rounded wings um, in, in shape. And then that's very distinctive in the field. But in terms of the fertile areas themselves, the great spangle has a very broad pale band in here. You can see it from a great distance in the field when it's closed. The Aphrodite in addition, and now, by the way, this one looks like it's, it's very easy because it's got a very dark uh, basal uh, color. They don't always have it that dark. And sometimes the gray spangle is darker. But the thing you want to look at is that this is almost gone. You know, there's, there's a very, very, very narrow band there. And that's, that's a key distinguishing feature between those two. Um, you know, uh, and uh, if you can find them, that's a, you're, 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 if you find those, tell everybody about it because we're, we're keeping our eyes open for them. There's some early fertilaries, um, which are and, and a common crescent, which we should talk about for a minute. There's the silvery checker spot, the Harris's checker spot, and the pearl crescent. Now, the check these two checker spots are have gotten very local in our area. They're both declining. One, the silvery is in woodlands where it feeds on woodland. The, the larva feeds on woodland sunflower. The Harris's checker spot is more northerly. Its caterpillars feed only on flat top white aster. Um, and it usually is in a kind of more of a wetland area. Um, we still have a colony of, we have colonies locally of both of them remaining, but they're, they're getting very scarce. Go north, as Harry will, as, as, sorry, as, as, as Charlie, well, Harry, or Charlie will tell you, go further north and you'll find these still fairly common or very common, but in our area, they're dwindling. And finally, there's the Pearl Crescent. And the Pearl Crescent is, is not exactly specialized at all. You can find Pearl Crescents just about any darn place you look. You know, they're, they're one of our commoner um, small butterflies. So how do you tell them? And by the way, you see these two, these two, you're, we're just about gone by now. You know, so if you get really you know, torqued up, you better get out in the field quick because they're just about gone. Um, Pearl Crescents, they're going to be around almost all the time. So here we have the two checker spots. We have the silvery checker spot, Harris's checker spot, and the pearl crescent. Pearl crescent is a little bit smaller, but how do you tell them apart? Okay. The silvery checker spot has quite pronounced dark spots with a white center down here on the, on the hind wing. Okay. The 
Harris is, has little bitty white spots, so you got to be careful of that. But they're not they're not anywhere as big or as pronounced as that. Um, the pearl crescent has nothing like that. It has little black little black dark dot 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 circles, you know, along its hind wing. Easier way to tell them to be absolutely sure what you've got is look at the look at the rims on the wings. The silvery checker spot has a very very broad um, uh, border on its forewing. And if you if you do an imaginary little ellipse there, you'll see that the entire wing pattern is contained within that ellipse, if you see. Not so with the Harris's, which has a much thinner one. And also, if you try and draw that same thing, you can't contain its black area in the same ellipse, you know, because it's going to be, it, it, it's not even edged on the outside. Um, you know, so that's that that's one way you can tell. Um, the uh, pearl crescent has a pearl crescent mark here as well as below, and that's why they call it a pearl crescent. But it also has, um, oops, sorry, it also has two, um, and it kind of splits off on this four wing pattern. This sometimes can be very pronounced, or sometimes it's not, but it has it's kind of got two antennae coming up here, or two bands coming out. Below, it's much easier to tell. The silvery checker spot, if you're trying to compare these two, is very pale beneath with some nice patterns, and it has a big white spot right there. And that's how everybody tells that. The Harris's, I'm not even going to talk about it. If you can't tell a Harris's from a silvery, um, um, your optometrist would like to speak with you. Um, the uh, pearl crescent has a bunch of different forms. I'm not going to get into them here. This little thing here is the pearl crescent. Um, that you see, and it's getting kind of a, usually in a dark field with the rest of it as being pale. You say, well, gee, I can hardly see that. Yeah, that's because it's very fresh. Once it wears a little bit, um, the, some of the scales go off, some of the dark scales go off, and it'll look much more easy to tell. You know, and that's, this is a very common butterfly. So before we leave these, there's a couple of really em embattled and danger ones that are worth looking at. There's the silver bordered fertilary. There used to be in our area but they really are practically gone. Charlie, are there any have, um, colonies left you know of? Uh, he can't probably can't get on. Thumb up, yes. Thumb down, no. Yeah, no. Um, no. Okay. I know. Yeah, they're they're pretty they're pretty, pretty much gone. Here's the one that's a real loss, though. They used the meadow fertilary used to be very common, and it's practically gone at this point. And this is in 1993. Um, the Baltimore used to be fairly common. It is now limited to isolated colonies in different places. So what's been going on? Well, you'll see they're all out right now. But one of the things you'll also see is that the meadow fertilary in 93 used to be very common. It used to be a really regular butterfly. They're gone from Pound Ridge. They're gone from most places. Why is that? You know, why should these things disappear? Well, for the first two, um, the caterpillars feed on violets. And the deers, the deer have browsed the violets away terribly in many places, as well as invasive plants have crowded them out. Um, so you're, you don't get them anymore. And that has literally caused these populations to go uh, to be extirpated. Um, the other thing with the Baltimore, and this is a real strange, the Baltimore, when I was coming through, its only host plant was a, was a wildflower called turtle head, which is basically a marsh plant. Okay. Um, Turtlehead also has been browsed almost to extinction by deer, but the Baltimore has figured out how to use plantain, particularly the tall English plantain, which, as you know, is a, a common weed. Now, it doesn't use it everywhere, but the colonies that everyone knows about now are using plantain. They're not using turtlehead anymore. Um, and so there used to be a regular butterfly at Pound Ridge. Um, you still see them occasionally, but they're basically pretty much gone there. So. That's a that's a sad thing. And here they are. These are these rare ones. This is a meadow fertilary, which still has uh, still has some strongholds in your area. Has a very elongate wing, um, small butterfly. The the silver bordered um, has a has a much shorter, stumpier wing. Um, and and but be careful because you're, you're looking for a silver border. The silver border is underneath. It's not on top. You know, so everybody says, well, where's the silver? The silver border is below. Um, the metal fertilizer, you can tell very easily, is kind of mudgy, smudgy underneath, as opposed to this nice pattern 
that you get on the silver border. And again, I'm not sure I need to tell you what, if you can't tell what a Baltimore looks like underneath and above, again, you know, consult your um, uh, eye care specialist. There's a lot of we call brush feet or general common nymphalids in our area. I'm not going to go through these. Most of them you can figure out on your own. Just look at the books. They're, they're pretty distinct and pretty easy to tell. There's only two I'm going to really look at tonight, um, which are the American and Painted Lady, which people get confused pretty often, but they're actually pretty easy to tell apart. Okay, here is the pair of them together. The American lady on the left and the painted lady. Now, they're very different because the American lady is a resident in our area. The painted lady is worldwide, and it basically lives in the, in the neotropics in the summer, sorry, in the winter, and then comes north every year and emigrates, sometimes in vast numbers, sometimes not at all, into our area. So they're, they're, they have very different lifestyles, but you can find them both in fields, sometimes right next to each other. Okay, how do you tell these two lovelies apart? Well, first of all, the first thing you look for is, if, if you look along the forewing, is there a nice white dot? <laughs> that white dot is diagnostic if you see it. The bad news is the American lady doesn't always have the white dot. Usually does, but doesn't always. If you don't see the white dot, yeah, you still got to look at the other things. But if you do see the white dot, you're done. You, you're finished. There's no white dot on the, um, you know, on the painted lady. There's also here, this is a kind of a fine point, but the there's a loop that kind of goes around. It's a it's broken. The loop is broken in the American lady, whereas it's continuous in the painted lady. So you see there's almost like a like a like a, a wagon wheel in the uh in the paint in the painted lady. N not so in the American. You know, and th those are a little bit hard, but those, you know, you get to used to those field marks and you can tell them pretty quickly. Now. The other thing to look for is the shape. The um, American lady has what we call a falcate tip. Falcate means that there's an indentation here and then it comes up and it kind of squares off at the top like a mesa, okay? Whereas you have a nice rounded tip on the, on the painted lady. And again, that you can see that in flight and you can see that at a pretty fair distance if you look for it. The other thing, which this is the standard thing, is that there's two eye spots on the hind wing of an American lady. Um, but everybody says, oh, look for the eye spots. Well, actually, don't look for the eye spots. I, see that dark field there? You can see the dark field from halfway across the field. You know, um, you can see it from a great distance. If you see that dark patch, the um, uh, painted lady, this is very pale in this area. And yeah, it has four eye spots, but way before you can see the four eye spots, you're going to be, the tell, be able to tell the difference between this very dark area and this, which is paler. You know, so I'm, I'm not a big one for saying, oh, check the number of eye spots. Yeah, you'll want to check that, but it's not, that's not the easiest thing to see, you know, when you're in a hurry and you're trying to figure out what you're looking at on a busy, on a busy 4th of July count. Okay. Finally, then we're getting to the end now of the regular, regular butterflies. And the last group I'm going to talk about is the summer satyrs or browns, the browns and the satyrs. Um, they're an interesting group. The common one in our area is the little wood satyr, um, which is interesting because it has two brood peaks which, which are quite close to each other. You see, there's one that comes into June and then the other one. These are considered by some to be separate species or at least separate populations because there isn't enough time from when they come out here to when they show up here for them to go through a full brood cycle. You know, so anyway, there's a lot of discussion about that. You also get two common field ones called the common ringlet and the common wood nymph. The common wood nymph comes out later, just starting to come out now. The common ringlet, you may not see on the Chris, on the 4th of July count. They, they come a little earlier and then they come a little later. And the Appalachian brown, here you need to, you need to go to somewhere like, um, like Pound Ridge or somewhere that has kind of wet meadows with sedges in them. And the northern pearly eye is a woodland species that feeds mainly on rotting materials and feces, which is not, not attractive, but it's a very interesting butterfly. Okay, let's look at them. Here we are. There, this is the prime time for a lot of these browns now. This is the little wood satyr and the common ringlet. These are two you see flying together. You say, well, I can't possibly confuse those two. Yes, you can. Many people confuse them um, because when flight, 
the orange that you see there on this nicely colored common ringlet is not that obvious. They fly very similarly. They're in, in, in fields, often shortcut fields, um, woodland edges, and, and they flutter a lot and, and they can be very uh, easy to confuse. So anytime you see these flying along, you should check them out and just be sure you don't have a common ringlet. Um, the, the default choice is, is little wood sayer. The one that's starting to come out now is a larger butterfly called the common wood nymph. Um, and you see that here. And the common wood nymph, as you can see, well, let, let's go through the field marks. Here you have four equal sized eye spots, you know, along the end. Now that's, I, I consider that one eye spot. You know, so you have four dots. The, um, in, if you, if you're comparing with the wood nymph, the wood nymph just has two eye spots and they're inside of a yellow field. Now, if any of you have a summer place further north, uh, like in the Adirondacks or somewhere, you will see common wood nymphs that are all brown above with the two eye spots. That's called the Nephli form, which I don't want to confuse anyone with because you don't find that in our area. But if you if you're if you're traveling somewhere, yeah, you can see one that that doesn't have the yellow in it, um, and so don't don't freak out. Not most people don't freak out over butterfly ID, but you could. And the um, the um, common ringlet generally has a single eye spot on the forewing, although you will see them where the eye spot is reduced and sometimes not even there. So sometimes you don't see it at all. And you usually see this, this, this hind wing can be absolutely pale or it can have a very marked white zigzag on it. Um, so this, is the, this one is quite variable in what you see, but you're always gonna see some orange on it, especially on the forewing. Um, and, and even in flight, if you get a decent look at it, you'll see the orange on the forewing. That's not hard to see. Now, if you see a little wood satyr with no dots on the top, it's actually a Carolina satyr. They don't occur in our area. Call me. I'll, I'll take a collect call because I'd want to see that if it ever gets to our region. Now, two more satyrs, then we're done with this group. The, these are two more specialized satyrs. <laughs> The Appalachian brown, which lives in sedge meadows, the uh, northern uh, pearly eye, which is basically a woodland butterfly. <clears throat> How do you tell them apart? But sometimes you can see them in the same areas, and, and people do make get confused with these. <clears throat> okay, the first thing you're going to look for is that the outer edge of the uh, Appalachian brown is quite rounded, where it's very um, it's very ragged edge in the um, pearly eye. And you say, oh, that's clearly ragged. I, the, the fact is the edge isn't that ragged. It's the pattern that makes it look ragged. It's really not as ragged as it looks, um, but that's an, it's a bit of an optical illusion, but that it still works as a field mark. The other thing is you look at the hind, hind wing dots <clears throat> and in the uh, Appalachian brown, these are all segmented. Now there's, there's separate little dotlings, if you will. That's a term I just made up. It's a scientific term. Um, here you have pea pod islets where they're surrounded by a, a white field all the way around them, you know, and so that's clear. The other thing which people will look at very commonly is that this is generally a pale butterfly with pale little stripes. And here you have much thicker lines on the, uh, you know, on the, on the northern pearly eye. If you're, if that doesn't help, you'll see, you'll see that you have rounded tips on the Appalachian brown. It's a very round shaped butterfly. Whereas you have these tall, they have this very tall forewing on the Northern pearly eye. And that's usually pretty impressive. And you can see it on the bottom picture. The one warning is if it's angled towards you a little bit, and I've seen people make this mistake. If it's angled towards you a little bit, that top forewing can look more rounded. It depends on, the, it depends on, on where it's pointing relative to you. So you want to look at some other field marks as well. And finally, you have here you have dark dots on the hind wing of the Appalachian brown, if you see it open, which you generally don't. And here you have these encircled dark spots on the, uh, on the northern pearly eye. Now, with that, oh, I'm sorry, that's mostly plain, and this is pretty, pretty colorful, more busy. Okay, now we move to the dreaded skippers. Before I do that, any, uh, I see there's some chats. Do we wanna catch up with any chats here? Uh, no, that was more general, maybe for the end. That'd be good. Okay, I'll take them then. Uh, here we start now with the dreaded skippers. 
just in case you're completely freaked out, these are all done skippers. So um, don't don't feel like you have to tell these apart um, because they're all the same thing. I just thought that was a nice little flight pattern. Okay, S two kinds of skippers. There's spread wing skippers and grass skippers. The spread wing skippers, there's lots of them. There's only a couple that I'm gonna talk about here. Um, in our in our time frame, roughly, there um, th I'm going to look at the silver spotted and the hoary edge. Compare those, and then I'm going to compare the northern and southern cloudy wings. Those are the there's lots and lots. I could spend hours on the dusky wings. Um, hey, um, Charlie will conf will uh, uh, confirm the fact that I will spend hours on those things, and it gets really exciting. But I'm not I'm not going to excite you with that stuff because I don't want anybody to get like overexcited and palpitating or anything. So here's the silver spotted skipper and the hoary edge. Silver spotted, very common, uses locust trees. Hoary edge, quite rare, although they're pretty common at Pound Ridge. So how do you tell them apart? On top, um, on top, um, oops, hang on. On top, they, they, uh, the um, uh, silver spotted has a much more elongate wing, much longer triangular wing, where it's a little more stubby on the um, uh, hoary edge, but you can't always see that. They have similar um, gold patterns on top. Um, there are some differences, like the, the, the outer line dot here on the silver spotted kind of stands away, whereas, he, whereas oops, here it kind of wedges in. You know, so this one kind of stands apart, this one kind of wedges in. But if you can't figure it out by the time you get to that, well, you know, I mean, that, that's a fine point. The way the way 95% of the people tell 95% of the sightings is you look underneath. Oops, I didn't put a ring around that. Okay, the silver spotted you know has some hoary you know some hoaring on the edge, but it has a sort of a central big white uh, bird dropping on it. The the hoary edge just has a white trailing area just on the hind wing. It bleeds a little into the forewing, but it's basically just the hind wing, and that and then that's the way most people just tell the two apart. Cloudy wings are harder, partly because they're very they're variable. They they differ between themselves, and this is the northern and the southern cloudy wings, both common in your area. Now, how do you tell them? From the top, there's a couple of ways of telling them. One way to tell them is that the northern has very faint marks here on top for the most part, whereas the southern has very pronounced marks. In particular. If you look here, there's kind of an hourglass shape on the southern. You see there's the top of the hourglass, the bottom of the hourglass. There isn't that on the northern. Sometimes these marks get big on a northern, like these marks, but you're not going to find the hourglass. So that's one of the things you want to look at. Okay. Also, the southern often has much brighter white fringe, but don't try that because that, that misleads people. Another key field mark is that the northern has a palps or its face, if you will, is dark, whereas the face on a southern cloudy wing is white. It's not always easy to see, but that is distinctive. Okay. And now the final thing, which I didn't even highlight here, look at the top of the antennal club. See how it's dark there? See how this one looks light? That's not just the lighting, that is true. If you see one of these things with, with white on the top, and this shows you that it's not always obvious, um, but see it's all dark there. You can see it's a little bit light there. If you can see that there's a lot white on there, that's another distinctive mark of the Southern. Um, so why, if, if you're saying, how am I gonna possibly see that? Well, the best thing to do is to start bringing your phone or a camera and taking pictures so you can compare them afterwards. That's the, that's the way people, most people are learning their butterflies these days. Okay. Now we go to the very dreaded grass skippers. And I'm gonna look for, first at a couple of the earlier emerging ones, some of which we're not gonna be seeing so much, um, at least until later. And, and the first two are the Pex and the Tawny Edge, and then I'm gonna look at Hobomoak and Zabulon, and then one of our really difficult pairs, which is the Indian and the Long Dash. So, and most, they're all flying in June, but you see they're starting to taper off now. By the time we get into where we're headed, um, some of these may not be as obvious. The pecs and the tawny edge you'll get, but some of these are starting to, to fade away. Also, the hobomoke only flies in the spring, whereas the zabulon 
um, after it's troughed, you'll get in the fall too. So here is Pex skipper, very common. Um, and how do you tell them? Well, the male on the Pex, very small skipper, it's a very small skipper. Um, it has a nice straight, this is called a stigma. The stigma is a black area that is full of, se of, of, of sex uh, sense. You know, it creates sex pheromones to, to attract the lucky females. And this one also has, one of the things that's distinctive, this one all has a, also usually has a broad scent patch. This scent patch also produces pheromones for the lucky female. The female, interestingly, her pattern is similar overall, but these areas here is just dark scales. There's no stigma because she's a female and she doesn't produce pheromones. Once again, most people don't start off telling pecs from the top, um, and I'll show that in a minute, but here is the other one you'll see early-ish in the spring, which is the tawny edge, but you'll also see this in these in the summer. This is a difficult species. I'll talk about them later because um, they're, they're a little, they're, they're vague. You know, it's hard to get a handle on what they are. This is the tawny edge skipper. Um, the tawny edge has a very kind of blot-shaped stigma. This one was really thin. This one's kind of blot shaped. The female looks a bit like a broken dash. We'll talk about those later. Um, actually, let me do the, the underside, by the way, in the pecs is just very easy. <clears throat> the pecs has these two ba bands on them. Nothing else has bands like this. That's the only species you'll see. If you see those bands, you got a pecs. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> okay, here are the Hobomok and Zabulon skippers. The Hobomoke is a, is a very prominent spring skipper. We've been seeing them all through June. Um, the Zabulon you see in June, uh, used to be southerly, you didn't see them in June, but you see them now. And the Zabulon will also be one of the commonest fall skippers that you'll see late summer and fall skippers. Um, if you see one of these in the fall, it's a Zabulon, so forget about it. Um, how do you tell them? There's, they're, they can be difficult to tell, but here's the, th here's the way you start. If you see the male from above, <clears throat> you look at this dark pattern here and it looks like an S shape. Very clear, it, it, it's all connected and it looks like an S. If you see a Zabulon, it looks kind of like a blot with a, with, a, with a hat on it or no, carrying an umbrella. It's not, it's not um, a single S shape mark. So it, it, it's kind of a broken up mark. But the thing you really want to look at which, which, which is the diagnostic, is if you can see the top side of the hind wing. And by the way, this, what we're seeing now is these, these are like a, a, a jet fighter. They hold their hind wings down and they hold their, high, their forewings cocked like, like a jet fighter. <clears throat> this is the upper part of the hind wing. You'll see that these are all outlined in black. In the Zabulon, except for maybe this one, they're all completely connected. There's no outlines. And you can see that very easily in the field. You can see that this one has the outlines on the hind wing, this one doesn't, all right? Underneath, not so hard to tell. The, um, uh, the Hobomoke basically is two-toned. It has this nice band mark in the back with a, with a jutting, one more jutting cell. And it's mainly dark here. You can get a little light color there, but not so much. Here, you get on the Zabulon, you get a distinct yellow shoulder and below, I'm sorry, below, pardon me, you get this, this kind of pied, um, very pretty yellow dotted pattern. With the only thing you can fuse that with is sometimes it would be a fiery skipper or something, which we're not talking about today. Okay, here's the real killer that people have trouble with. They shouldn't have as much trouble as they do, but everyone does. This is Indian skipper versus long dash. They're both marsh feeders. They both feed on sedges. You'll find them both in areas with blue flag. You know, so if you know what area of blue flag, look for these things in the in the kind of mid spring um, to just about now. But there's there's they're pretty much gone at this point, and the Indian comes out a little earlier. How do you tell them? Okay, first of all, the Indian skipper has a very broad brown band on it, where um, whereas the the others don't. It also has a very narrow stigma, <clears throat> kind of reminds you. Um, you know, of, of um, you know, of, of a uh, peck skipper or something. The um, long dash is named for the male long dash is named for this big, um, uh, this big kind of discontinuous uh, dash that it's got going across its its um, its body. 
Interestingly, this part is just scales. This is the stigma. The stigma is where the sex pheromones come from. This is actually just regular wing cells. Um, the, um, the female, um, yeah, it, this is pretty fun. The female has a, a, a bleeding edge, if you will. Uh, you see how this, it almost looks like the, the cells are melting into the, into the band there. Um, similarly on a long dash, but again, the long dash has the female kind of mimics again, the, the male's general pattern. Um, and has this this big mark, which is nothing like the Indian. So if you can see him from the top, you're going to be doing okay. Below, which is where you usually see them, there's a couple of real tricks. People get very confused, but there are some tricks. Here's the trick. First thing is, you look at the underside hind wing here, and in the Indian skipper, particularly you can see it here, these two marks are almost entirely below these these three. In other words, it's, it's this way, then it breaks, and then there's these three, okay? You can see that here. There's this mark, and then this other mark set up above. On the long dash, it's like a stack of books, okay? You know, there's no discontinuity there. If you see that discontinuity, you see, I mean, here, that 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 mark is only like halfway up at best. Here, it's, it's barely halfway up. This is basically like, like, a, like a kind of a, a, a teetering stack of books. That's very easy to tell. The other thing you'll notice, this is a Hesperia, and all the Hesperias share this. This I call the wrist mark, which is, I'm going to take it off for a second. Here, these, this, these white marks here, these two dots, the outer dots, are completely outside this band. Here you can see it as well. So you've got the wrist mark, and then you've got these marks, and they're completely outside of it. On the, on the long dash, uh -uh. they either don't have the dots at all or the dots are kind of obscured there. If you can see those two things, get used to them, you know, you, you've got it nailed. I'm sure you'll all do that the very next time you see one in the field. Okay, now, at Charlie's urging, I put in some of the other, I'm calling these little orange wonders. Um, something you'll start seeing about now is the leash skipper, little tiny skipper, you'll see it kind of darting through foliage. This is the European skipper. When I first started, there weren't any European skippers um, in the U.S. They came in with Timothy in Canada, and they spread everywhere. For a while, they were hyperabundant. You could see 10,000 a day. Now they've died down, as often happens with introduced species. And now, and then you get the Delaware skipper, which is one of our commonest of summer skippers, very bright orange with the male and the female patterns. Below, um, you'll see that the leaf skipper tends to be very orange. The European skipper varies from orange to kind of pale buff. And the, I'm oh, sorry, and the, um, and the um, Delaware skipper is also very orange. Now, when you're telling them apart, these two are very small. They're both very small skippers. Um, and you'll notice that the wing shape is completely different. This has an oval shape to the wing like none of our other skippers. And this has a very pointed shape, which is, again, like triangular, which is like none of our skippers. The Delaware skipper has a very long uh, forewing. And that's one of the ways you tell that. Okay. Moving ahead. Now, now we're going to get into the final group here, which is the wonderful witches, which is the um, summer, the confusing summer skippers. Um, and if anyone wants to go, um, you know, take a nap or have a, you know, get a cup of coffee, you know, uh, you should do that now because this is, this is, this is the finale of what we're going to see here. And some of these are not that easy. But again, most of the people who I get used to going on the field with can start, you can start to tell them in just a glance. So here you see, these are all ones that are coming out just about now. So you, 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 you know, you got to be ready for anything. Any, you can see any of them anywhere. They're mostly in the fields is where you're going to find these things. Wet fields, dry fields, you can find them all together. Okay. This is... Um, when I do with for my club, I do this as a as a quiz. I ask people to say what it is. So, but I'm not going to do that with you guys. Um, this is a little glassy wing. Okay, um, how do you tell a little glassy wing? This is one of the common, common, common ones that you get out there. They're flying right now. This is the male and female. The male has this kind of um, twisted rectangle shape here. Again, you don't see anything like that in any other skipper. The female has an almost square large dot. 
And she also, well, I'm not going to talk about that. That's a fine point. Glassberg pointed out that the that on these butterflies, you can see a white base to the antennal club here. If you see that white base, that's a good mark, but others can show it too. It's not invariable. So I see some people miscalling things. We say, oh, I see some white at the base of the antennal club. Um, that isn't always good. So be careful what you read. This is the perhaps the commonest skipper. This is the Dunn skipper, which is, unfortunately, if it has to be common, it's also boringly plain, the Dunn skipper. Now, the male, this looks like the male is almost interesting to look at. But um, in both cases, now, I, I apologize that the color rendition isn't very good when you get into PowerPoint. This tends to be pretty green colored, um, kind of yellowish green and iridescent on the, on the Dunn skipper, especially the male especially when it's fresh. You can see that somewhat on some other skip, skippers, but it's pretty prominent here. And that should give you a hint. The male, um, this male is very fresh and he almost looks like he has a pattern. Within a week or so, these bright scales kind of wear away and he looks just plain brown. So if you see something that's just plain brown, it might be something else, but the chances are it's a done skipper. I'm not covering swarthy here. That's the only other possibility. The female, can also be plain brown, but sometimes, but she has a she has a um a, a, res, a wrist bracelet. The male doesn't have a wrist bracelet, by the way, and she often has a little a little bit of a spot pattern there. Although again, sometimes you don't see the spot pattern there. She can be altogether brown. So this is probably the most boring skipper you'll be likely to see when you're in the field. This is one an interesting one which we saw before. Here we have again the tawny edge skipper, small, and you'll start to see them. Remember, we have this big blotchy shaped um, um, uh, stigma area. It's almost like it's constricted, like it, you know, like it had gastric bypass or something. Um, the the male is very very orange, a very bright um, tawny edge on it. The female can often have a little bit of a tawny edge, but um, and and that varies. Sometimes quite a lot, other times not as much. The way you, I usually tell them is that the male has a kind of a, a square-shaped indent here. It almost looks like a, a brown box. It has these two little marks coming down. And that's and you can see it even here. That, that's a pretty good mark. The female, as again, has, again, has the, the wrist bracelets, which the male lacks. Um, and she has, um, she has bigger dots than the dun would have. <clears throat> the male has... Um, a yellow top, a bright yellow top to his antennal club. This is called a cross line skipper. You often find it in drier habitats. You call it cross line because in the male, the line, instead of coming down the wing, it comes across the wing. It has this big, big stripe, very prominent stripe shaped, shaped stigma going across the wing and, and, and a kind of a bright yellow pattern. The, there's, there's, there it is. And uh, as you see, it goes right across the wing. <laughs> the female has a bleeding box or a bleeding a bleeding dot. Again, you know, it's so you can see that you know the edges come down on on the bleeding dot. You know, um, and that's what kind of um, is as though it was melting. <laughs> These marks, by the way, some of the ones I'm giving you are things that after you get a picture of something, you can start to use it to sort out what it is you have. You're not necessarily going to see all these things in the field, but if you're aware of what they are, it can help you, you know, start to sort all this nice stuff out. <laughs> this is another fairly common one called the Northern Broken Dash. <clears throat> it's called a Northern Broken Dash because there's this part of the stigma and then this part of the pattern, and it's kind of broken. This is not actually a dash. It's not a stigma. It's just patterning, but that's why it's called a Broken Dash. And I guess the people who named it didn't know any better. It's fairly nondescript. It doesn't have as much yellow there or orange or, or tawny there. And it's, it's nothing very descriptive about it. If that's just what it is. It's kind of pale underneath. Um, the female is, is exceptionally plain. <clears throat> Although, remember we talked about the, the white? The female can show white at the base of the antennal club also. So don't look at that and think you necessarily have a, um, a, a little glassy wing. Because the little glassy wing has a female has a, a square pattern here, not kind of a bleeding pattern. <clears throat> that 
And also she has a pretty weak thing. I'm not going to get into that. That's too, that's too technical. <clears throat> now we get into some of the really fun ones. Last, last few I'm going to talk about. This is a black dash. You'll get these in wet areas, um, same kind of areas you'd find a um, uh, you know, an Indian or a, or a long dash in, but later in the season. These fly pretty late. You'll find them at Pound Ridge, like the end of Michigan Road, um, you know, or at the Wet Meadows. Um, the black dash, you know, has a nice black dash. It had, um, it kind of, it's, again, it has an umbrella over a dash pattern. <clears throat> the female has a pretty elongate, a large elongate um, uh, spot in her wing. And a, and a pretty prominent dot there. Um, underneath, they kind of have some markings, but not terribly distinctive. Now, here is the other equivalent that you can find in the same area, which is a Dion skipper, a little bit bigger. Hello, hello. Uh, you have a Dion skipper here. A Dion skipper has a very long, kind of sinuous stigma. But the main thing you look for, someone needs off mute. Um, the thing you look for on a Dion skipper basically is these two marks. You have a very large, um, very large uh, stripe down the upper forewing, upper hindwing. Excuse me. Um, you know that that's that you'll that will you'll tell. Um, and the females, you know, just like a lot of the others, um, underneath the little glassy wing looks like it has bro has bad bad dent bad dentures you know the orthodontist didn't get to it you know so it has these little teeth marks and they're not aligned properly <clears throat> the dun is basically plain underneath although sometimes you can get a little bit of a row like that on them but most of the time a dun is just going to look plain done <laughs> Um, and also one way to tell it for sure is that the male has no male has no bracelet. So if it's completely plain and there's no bracelet, well, it's going to be a done. I'm not going to go into all that. Okay, here's the tawny edge underneath. The tawny edge, the female has the has a, a, a wrist mark, the male doesn't. There's a meat breeding pair. The female in this case shows quite a lot of, of edge, which which you can, which can happen. Uh, and and but there's a lot of variants. You have to be careful. Most of the time, these look very plain underneath, but sometimes they're smudgy, and sometimes you can actually get a pattern on them. So don't get you know don't get blown away if you see a pattern because this is an extremely variable butterfly. The cross line is hard to tell underneath. These are males, and how do you tell it? Well, basically, because the little dot row is first of all, sometimes there's no dot row at all. You can tell it from a, a done or something because it's got, you know, it's got patterning up here. But this row goes straight up. No, no curve to it at all. It just goes straight up. The female, it, again, it goes straight up. But here sometimes there's a little jog. It goes up and then, and then in, up and in um, on the female sometimes. Um, but what you really want to look for there is if it has these small dots and they're kind of in a straight row, then you might have a cross line. The northern broken dash is, an, is a backwards three. That one's pretty easy to tell. It's a backwards three on it. You know, um, um, some people call it a flying seagull, but I, I prefer, prefer to think of it as a backwards three. Similar in shape, but different in color is the black dash, very closely related. And here, um, the, these marks are bigger and they tend to be yellow or, yellow or, yellow or buff colored unless it's very worn. And the whole, the whole color of the butterfly is different. Finally, um, the Dion is, um, is, is quite similar um, to the others, except for the fact that it has this big stripe. And, and that, that stripe is very, is very difficult to confuse. And if you see that, you've had a good day in the field because they're, they're not so easy to get. Okay, that is it. You now know everything in order to gird your grid and get out there and start to look at some of your local area butterflies.